Welcome to Nerd Heaven. I'm Adam David Collings, the author of Jewel of the Stars, and I am a nerd. This is episode 7 of the podcast. Now, just as I'm recording this, it's uh, starting to thunder outside, so I don't know if you're going to be able to hear it, but uh, we'll see what happens. <laughs> We're still working our way through my list of 10 episodes and movies you should watch before Star Trek Picard. Today, we're shifting from The Next Generation into Star Trek Voyager. True, Picard never appeared on Voyager, but another important character that will be appearing in the new show was a Voyager regular. I'm talking, of course, about Seven of Nine. So today, we look at my favourite Voyager story, Scorpion. The IMDB description for this episode reads, About to enter Borg space, Voyager finds a threat so devastating that even the Borg cannot deal with it. And this episode first aired on the 21st of May, 1997. Do it. This episode probably has the best teaser of any show I've seen. We open on two Borg cubes, their traditional greeting playing in that chilling voice. We are the Borg. Our first thought is, oh crap, it's the Borg. And this time, there are two ships. And then, something fires and the two cubes explode. What? The Borg are the most powerful, most fearsome force in the Star Trek universe, and something just tore through them like they were paper. That is terrifying. When you look at it, there are a lot of similarities between this episode and Best of Both Worlds. They're structured similarly, with slowly raising stakes, they balance the Borg stuff with some great character drama, there's that same sense of dread. And it even takes place over the Season 3, Season 4 transition. I can't believe this wasn't a deliberate attempt to recapture the magic. The really surprising thing is, it kind of worked. Scorpion is a great episode. So, John Rhys Davies guest stars in Star Trek. He plays a holodeck recreation of Leonardo da Vinci. When I first watched this, I didn't pick up on the name, but later I realised, oh, it was that guy I was familiar with from Indiana Jones, who would go on to play Gimli in Lord of the Rings. This sequence is actually quite long. At first, it may seem a pointless addition to the episode, if a great one but it sets up the relationship between the characters and feeds into an important scene later on. The idea that Voyager could be heading into Borg space is absolutely terrifying. Just one of their ships almost destroyed the human race, but to be going into the heart of their territory, their turf, that's almost beyond comprehension. How will they survive this? The Southwest Passage is an interesting possibility, an area devoid of Borg presence. Surely, that sounds too good to be true. And even if it wasn't, having so many Borg ships on either side would have to be a terrifying prospect. Of course, there is the question, would the Borg have any interest in a single Starfleet vessel in the Delta Quadrant? The Borg often ignore that which they don't consider a threat, and Voyager is no threat. Is there any advantage to the Borg in assimilating Voyager? Maybe not, at least not at the moment. Still, I wouldn't want to risk it. The Doctor's plan to learn how the assimilation process works and try to develop a medical defence is a great idea. This episode gives us our first mention of Borg nanoprobes, but they were implied in First Contact. The nanoprobes start by taking over the function of the victim's blood cells, making the host reliant on the Borg technology. I know, I keep using the word, but I'll say it again. Terrifying. Fifteen Borg vessels approach Voyager. Just like Best of Both Worlds, this story keeps upping the stakes. But after a quick scan, they fly on. Seems the Borg have something more important on their collective mind. There's a light-hearted scene in Janeway's quarters as she talks with Chakotay imitating the inflections of Picard and another captain. This instills a small amount of humour into an otherwise tense episode. 
Humour can be used effectively in a dark episode like it is here. This is an example of doing it effectively. There's a strong tendency very recently, which mostly comes from the Marvel movies, to inject large amounts of humour to keep things light. Most of the time it's not done well, at least according to my tastes. In this scene with Janeway and Chakotay, the tension is relieved just a tad, but the seriousness of their situation is still there. Contrast that with the dance off bro moment at the end of Guardians of the Galaxy, which completely deflates every molecule of tension for me, and killed the movie from that point on. Personal taste, obviously, but I much prefer how Voyager is doing it here. This scene also has some awesome character stuff. It establishes just how far Janeway and Chakotay's relationship has come, how much mutual support and trust exists between them. It's powerful stuff, and I love it. This moment is actually the absolute high point of their relationship, so remember it. When Voyager finds the destroyed remnants of those 15 cubes, wow, as Tom says, who could do this to the Borg? If I weren't already terrified before, I would be now. Harry, of course, sees the optimistic angle in this. The enemy of the Borg could be an ally. But what if they're not? They spot an alien ship attached to one of the cubes and decide to investigate. Voyager really benefits from First Contact's redesigns of the Borg for the big screen. That redesign carries over here and looks great. The inside of the Borg ship is creepier than we've ever seen it before. The first time I saw this scene, I had goosebumps. Put yourself in Harry's shoes. The sounds, the sparks, the drones that can barely function. Species 8472 are one of the most interesting aliens Star Trek has ever done. The first we see of them is their ship. It's a biological vessel. The interior design is awesome. You see what looks like a spinal cord, a circulatory system, a computer core laced with neural peptides. The episode spends a few minutes just exploring the wonders of this ship. The aliens themselves are awesome. Their non-humanoid design could never be done with a person in a suit. CGI creature effects were still very much in their infancy at this point, but despite the low resolution and primitive texturing, it looks great. When I jumped out at Harry, I jumped 50 metres. And you notice the music in this episode. It was especially good. It took things to a new level that Voyager rarely went. The aliens are telepathic. Their proximity is affecting Kess, enhancing her abilities. And we learn about the alien's motivation. It's summed up in the line, The weak will perish. Kess says, It's not the Borg we should be worried about. It's them. I'm not sure which is scarier, the Borg's emotionless pursuit, or Species 8472's cold malevolence. Both are chilling. Harry's in a bad way. The alien cells are consuming his body. It makes good sense that the humans have an advantage in this situation. What the Borg can't assimilate, they can't understand. But humans don't assimilate, we investigate. And in that case, it gives us the advantage. The alien cells have an incredible immune response, but by coding the Borg nanoprobes to disguise as alien cells, they can fight them. This is all great stuff. And then the terrible truth. The Northwest Passage is free from Borg because that's where species 8472 are coming from. They've come from another place where there is no other life, and they intend to wipe out all life in our universe. It's like the Nazis, only much worse. They are the only species that deserves to exist. Everything else is inferior and must be destroyed. I've heard it speculated that maybe there was other life where Species 8472 came from, but they killed it all. How scary is that? So Janeway goes back to the holodeck to seek counsel from Da Vinci. Maybe the character can spark something in her mind. I quite enjoyed Da Vinci's suggestion to appeal to God, as a person of faith myself. In Star Trek, prayer is not the usual suggestion when people cannot find a solution to their problem. Not believing in God, 
Janeway politely rejects Leonardo's offer to visit the monastery and pray together, but it does strike a new idea in her mind. A deal with the devil, or in other words, a temporary alliance with the Borg. It's an awesome scene. At face value, an alliance with the Borg is ridiculous. But as Janeway points out, this is a unique situation. They've never been so vulnerable, and the Voyager crew have something they need. Chakotay thinks the plan is too risky. He shares an interesting story about a scorpion, explaining that a monster cannot change its nature, no matter how much it may want or even needs to. It's actually really quite effective. The argument between Janeway and Chakotay is brilliant. They both make good points. It digs deep into the characters. This is where their relationship starts to go downhill. Janeway feels she no longer has his support, only his obedience. She feels that she is alone. If you had any doubts about the power of Species 8472, we see them fire a beam and destroy an entire planet. This is Shadow and Vorlon level firepower if you're familiar with Babylon 5. As with Best of Both Worlds, I didn't watch this episode on TV. At this point, we were so far behind America and getting further behind. They'd kind of alternate between DS9 and Voyager year for year, showing one show in the first year, and then showing the other show in the next year. I gave up on Channel 9 very quickly, and ended up buying every episode on VHS. They put out a tape with two episodes every month, 12 tapes every year. So I only had to wait one month to see part two, whereas in America they had to wait three months. We had a little Christmas tradition. Every January, during the school holidays, we'd make our way down to Hobart, the capital city of our state. While there, we'd visit this sci-fi shop called Area 52 and buy the season premieres of DS9 and Voyager. That was an exciting summer. Not only did we get part two of Scorpion and the introduction of Seven of Nine, we also got the beginning of the Dominion War. This truly was the golden age of Star Trek. The show was at its height. So Janeway has convinced the Borg to work together on a weapon that will work against Species 8472. The Borg will take Voyager to the other end of their space. And the Doctor's cure works, saving Harry's life and proving that they can fight the aliens on the cellular level. It makes sense that the Borg would want to temporarily assimilate Janeway and Tuvok in order to work more efficiently together. Janeway comes up with an alternate suggestion. Choose a representative to speak for the Borg, just as they did when they assimilated Picard. Enter Seven of Nine. For whatever reason, they chose not to do the distortion effect on Seven's voice. I'm not sure why, but it was kind of glaring by its absence. The Borg sacrifice one of their cubes to protect Voyager from Species 8472. It makes sense from their point of view, it's just a tactical decision. Janeway's life is in danger and she needs surgery. She makes her wishes very clear to Chakotay. The Alliance must continue. The Alliance is very difficult to keep together. The Borg want to modify things, so I can understand their perspective. Things are going badly. The war will be lost by the time they get Voyager clear of the Borg space. Therefore, they have to adjust the plan. Chakotay refuses to budge and ends the alliance. The last thing Janeway would want. I'm glad I'm not in Chakotay's place because I don't know what I'd do. When the Borg try to assimilate the ship, Chakotay has no choice but to blow them all into space. Seven of Nine is the only one left now but she manages to pull them into fluidic space, the realm of Species 8472. I wonder if fluidic space is somewhere physically in our universe, or if it's in another dimension. Again, some great world building. So much more creativity is put into Species 8472 than is usual for Star Trek aliens. And Chakotay guesses the disturbing truth. The Borg started this war. They entered fluidic space in an attempt to assimilate them. Their mistake may have destroyed our entire galaxy. <laughs> That's the horn, I better go help my wife unpack the groceries. 
I'll be back. Uh, I'm back. Janeway has recovered from her surgery and she is not happy. Chakotay's decision to end the alliance in opposition to her orders damages their relationship. Over the course of this episode, they manage to work out the differences, but the relationship has been broken. Just as in real life, when a relationship has been damaged like this, it takes a long time to heal. Janeway and Chakotay's relationship will improve over time, but it will never really get back to where it was at the beginning of this episode. They use a power surge to disable Seven of Nine when she tries to assimilate Voyager. That surge disconnects her from the Collective. Like Hugh, she is now alone. Will she begin to regain her individuality as he did? One interesting thing we learn, Seven of Nine was originally human. Her name was Annika Hansen. That may seem like a huge coincidence, but it makes sense the Borg would choose a former human as their representative. So that was Scorpion. It leaves us with a lot of uncertainty regarding what will happen with Seven of Nine. We'll pick that up with the very next episode next time, The Gift. We know Seven of Nine will play a part in the new Star Trek Picard. This was the episode that introduced her, but we really haven't seen her yet. We've seen the Borg drone that became her. Next time we'll meet the actual character. I'll see you then. Live long and prosper. Make it so.